I'm not strong enough to bend bars with my bare hands, but by the end of this video, I will have bent this bar. I'll do that with this hydraulic jack. A hydraulic jack is a device that combines two simple machines, a lever and a variable bore hydraulic cylinder. And taken together, these two simple machines will increase the force that I apply by a factor of 150. This hydraulic jack also highlights a property of motionless fluids that differentiate them from solids, which is that the mechanical forces that they can generate are isotropic and are defined by the pressure and therefore the forces that they generate are proportional to the area over which they're applied. This hydraulic jack has a number of parts. It has a lever arm that I can actuate. That lever arm drives this piston, which is connected to a reservoir of oil. Inside the jack, there are two ball valves that rectify the motion. They allow me to apply a reciprocating motion to this lever arm and to drive the oil in one direction, basically creating a reciprocating pump. That oil that's being pressurized is then connected to a larger bore hydrostatic ram. This is converting a small force being applied on one side to a large force being applied on the other side. And this is explained by the hydrostatic equation and the definition of pressure in a quiescent fluid. Okay, let's use this jack to bend this bar. Now, some people may be able to bend a bar with their bare hands or with their head or their neck, but I prefer to use the advantage afforded by the hydraulic jack. And that comes really from the definition of what a pressure is. The internal and external surfaces of a solid can generate stresses in any direction. So regardless of what the direction is of the force I apply to this solid object, the object can resist me. I can push from this direction or this direction or that direction, and the solid always resists. And this is consistent with the fact that a solid can generate anisotropic stresses inside the material. A motionless fluid, on the other hand, can only generate stresses isotropically. So if I take this water and I push on it with my finger, the water can only push back isotropically. It can only generate a pressure in the direction of the normal of the surface between the water and my finger. And that means that as I move my finger into and out of the water, the fluid has to deform. It eventually comes to an equilibrium, but it has to be an equilibrium that comes from this fluid pushing isotropically onto my finger. And this is the fundamental difference between a solid and a liquid. We think of a solid holding its shape, and we think of a liquid filling a container. But the difference between these two in terms of the fundamental properties are the difference between being able to generate only isotropic stresses, as is the case with a liquid or a gas, or being able to generate anisotropic stresses, as is the case with a solid. So for motionless fluid, like the water inside this beaker, or as we would approximate the oil inside this hydraulic jack, we can generate the hydrostatic equation, which tells us that the pressure is a function only of its variation with uh, altitude or with elevation. It tells us that inside a beaker of water like this, the pressure increases as we start at the surface and move down into it because of the force of gravity of this water pushing down on the system. This system can't be in equilibrium unless the gravity force that's pulling down on it is balanced by a pressure gradient. We can derive this by drawing a control volume over a mass of this liquid or any other fluid and showing that the integrated gravitational force that's generated inside the entire control volume is balanced by the integrated pressure force that we get by integrating over the control surface. So we derive the hydrostatic equation by performing this analysis on this control volume, balancing the gravitational forces and the pressure forces. And it's relatively straightforward because these are the only two forces that we need to consider and because the pressure acts isotropically. When we've completed this, we get the integral form of the hydrostatic equation, which describes the difference in the pressure between one point and another as a function of the altitude difference and the density of the fluid. So the hydrostatic equation is important because of what it includes, the variation of pressure with altitude. And this explains, for example, why the air is thin at the top of a mountain or at the altitude that a plane flies at. 
It also explains why the pressure goes up when we go underwater. So when you dive to the bottom of a swimming pool, your ears pop, or when you go scuba diving, your ears pop. And in all these cases, this is explained by the fact that the pressure of a fluid has to increase in response to the weight of all of the fluid on top of it. Now, if you want to bend a bar of metal, though, what matters isn't so much how things vary with altitude, because this jack is small and the altitude doesn't change very much. What's important about the hydrostatic equation is what it excludes. It doesn't have any dependence on x, it doesn't have any dependence on y, and it doesn't have anything describing the details of the geometry. All that it says is that if pressure is changing, it's only changing in the z direction, and there's very little z here. And what that means is for a system like this, we can approximate the pressure as being uniform. What that tells us is that when we start to think of the forces in the system, we have a force being applied down on a piston, we have a force being applied up on a ram. In both of these cases, this force is equal to a pressure times an area. The pressure times the area is different on these two sides. The pressure is uniform, the hydrostatic equation tells us that. So when we apply a force down on a small area, we generate a large pressure. That large pressure is, exists in the oil on this side all the way through the bottom and over on this side. We've then generated a large pressure that's being applied to a larger area. And so the resulting force that's being applied on the side of the ram is significantly larger than the force that we apply at the piston. If we look at the internal structure of a hydraulic jack, the force amplification comes from applying a force to a small area and having that generated pressure then be applied to a large area. The hydraulic machine being generated by this oil is a variable bore hydraulic cylinder. It's just a cylinder of small area on one side and of large area on the other side. And the mechanical advantage that you gain is the ratio of the areas in these two sides. The behaviors of this hydraulic jack highlight the differences between solids and liquids. When we apply a force to the piston, we're driving a solid object. And solids are good at transmitting forces because internally they can generate anisotropic stresses. So no matter what sort of force we apply to them, they generate anisotropic stresses internally to hold their shape, transmitting that force directly. The piston transmits the force to the oil, the oil transmits a pressure to the ram, and then that ram, that pressure being applied to a large area, generates a force on the other side. Now we don't get everything for free, just as is the case with all simple machines, when we amplify the force, we decrease the distance. So this system is amplifying the force by a very large amount, but the net result is that the distance that's traveled is less. So the total, of for the total of work, which is force times distance, is the same on either side. So nothing about this analysis actually took into account the properties of the fluid inside this hydraulic jack. None of our equations have properties of the fluid. In fact, it mostly doesn't matter what the fluid is. We just need it to be a fluid. However, there's a specific reason why we use oil, and that's because we want the system to be incompressible and we want the system to be a good lubricant. If we replaced this liquid with a gas, we would find that the liquid would compress. So as we increase the pressure that we were applying, that system would compress and we wouldn't be driving the ram. Similarly, if we filled the system with water, we'd find that this jack would corrode over time. So oil is the fluid of use in these sorts of hydraulic systems. Now, hydraulic principles similar to this jack are used in many, many different devices. They can be used in braking systems, they can be used in mechanical lifts or cranes or uh, hydraulic presses, for example, that we would use to compress materials. Fluids have a property that we call pressure, and for motionless systems, this pressure describes the isotropic stress that is felt everywhere in the system, both inside the fluid and where the fluid interacts with its environment. The hydrostatic equation, which is equilibrium between the pressure gradient in a system and the gravitational force, tells us that that, that pressure varies only with the vertical elevation. For a system like a hydraulic jack, the vertical elevation doesn't change very much, and so the hydrostatic equation tells us that the pressure is approximately uniform. This hydraulic jack uses a variable bore hydraulic cylinder to apply that uniform pressure over a small area in one place and over a large area in the other place, thereby gaining a mechanical advantage that's given by the ratio of the areas of these two sides.